Okay. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today for a special teaching seminar. Usually our seminars focus more on research, but we like to cover um, teaching methods and related topics at least uh, once or twice a semester. So today we're really fortunate to have a special guest from Emory University, Dr. Cecile Janssens. And she is a, a research professor of epidemiology in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory. She has a strong interest in research methodology, statistics, research integrity, and ethics. She conducts research on the translation of genomics to applications in clinical and public health practice, focuses on genetic prediction of multifactorial diseases, as well as theoretical and methodological questions in the prediction and assessment of clinical validity and utility of predictive testing. Um, but she's recently um, discovered uh, a great passion for teaching, as we'll hear about today, especially using these novel methods. Um, and she, um, she teaches critical thinking, grant writing, and scientific writing. And so today we'll be hearing her perspectives on modern novel uh, teaching approaches, especially in the area of um, the current era of online and hybrid teaching formats. So uh, thank you for taking the time today, Dr. Johnson. Okay, let me um, share my screen. Um, uh, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to share um, about this topic. Um, um, as you said, I, um, I re uh, relatively recently developed an enormous passion for teaching. And that came uh, because I was working on genetics um, for most of my career and then a few years ago, I had the serendipity finding out of my um, my fields that I felt very valuable if, um, um, to focus on. I developed a new way of searching scientific literature. It's called COCITES, C-O-C-I-T-E-S. And um, that project uh, was so interesting and it got me totally out of the predictive genetic testing. Uh, but it was also, it was very interesting, but it was not going to be my new career. I had one good idea, but not really enough to make it a new a new research line. And so after that project ended, I was kind of in limbo what to do next. Was I going to do the predictive genetic testing again? Or was I, I, I didn't know. And I, um, I discussed with my, uh, the head of the department that I would take a break um, from research to think about next steps. And that in the meantime, I would um, uh, do some extra teaching, you know, to, to fund my salary. And um, what, what I didn't, re didn't realize then is how that would enormously change my views on um, also on the science, but also on teaching. I very early on, I flipped uh, the classroom and I'm going to share today what, uh, what I did. Um, and it is since then that I really um, enjoy the teaching, the teaching so much. And I hope to, to share that with you um, today. Um, so um, the, my, I have only a little background on this topic. So I'm not an, a, a teaching expert. I'm not a um, you know education expert with with um, with a lot of um, background in it. I teach um, two classes that I will talk about today. They both are about critical thinking. One for the bachelor students, one for the MBH students at our School of Public Health. But I've also written a few pieces about this on how. Um, um, I learned so much from, from flipping the classroom and also why the flipped classroom, I will in a minute um, explain what it is, is so enormously handy for online teaching. And this is a piece that I wrote in Dutch about it um, also because it's, um, um, it requires a little bit of a different way of grading. And, uh, you know, with hindsight, I think that that way of grading pays, pays a lot of more respect to the students than the traditional way that I was used to do. So I always, always have an, um, so I'm teaching critical thinking and it is also because I've always had a strong interest in research methods, um, but also in science communication and especially about our epi research, how it reaches the news. Um, I've always been disturbed when uh, uh, journalists write news articles about scientific studies and the news articles give a biased presentation of the real science that was, was was been conducted. So early on, I wrote commentaries on that on the, in the Huffington Post, but I recently have switched my uh, my my post to um, to another platform, Medium, where I do essentially the same. I comment on studies uh, that are in the news that all the journalists write in the same way about, and then missing the you know the critical details of a study that that basically um, invalidate the findings. 
And so here on the right, you see uh, my column in a Dutch um, um, newspaper, so major newspaper in the Netherlands, where I um, critique about scientific reporting there. And it's all about what is the science behind the news. And that's uh, I'm also the focus of my two classes on critical thinking. I come back to those later. So um, I've always had a very ambivalent um, relationship with teaching where I came from in the Netherlands. Teaching was really considered something that we had to do, not because we really liked to do it, but because the students needed to have courses. And um, that never really was my, I, I, never, I never enjoyed that. So early on when I came to Emory, I always have this slide in my slide deck of my classes. Um, this is basically how I prefer to teach. I prefer that students take the lead in what they need to know. They come to class, they come, they pay a lot of money to get to our classes. So I always felt like, okay, you want to know something, tell me what you want to know. But that is of course not how teaching works. So um, we are used to lecturing um, and I was doing that at the same time too. I was giving my lectures, but that, that ideally I wanted them to take over the lead of my courses and tell me what they wanted to know. I wanted highly interactive classes. Um, and I always emphasize that, you know, the, as a teacher of an instructor, I, there's only so much I can bring into the class. If you don't react, then nothing happens. But at the same time, after sharing this for many years, it didn't really work. So my classes were, they were a bit interactive, but not as much as I wanted. And then uh, um, um, I realized later on that, you know, the way how I was teaching wasn't eliciting this response for, for the students. It was really from my, I was lecturing, but at the same time asking the students to interrupt me and that doesn't work. Uh, not physically and not uh, definitely not online. And especially online um, is, is a problem that we often face. Uh, I always have to remember um, to think of the bystander effect. We have it in the, in the classroom too. If I ask a question to a class, uh, then often nobody responds. And I'm sure that there are several students who know the answer because when I call them out by their name, then I get answers. But when I just answer a question, ask a question to a class, then many times nobody responds. And on, on Zoom, that is even uh, sometimes a bigger problem because then, and I also uh, feel that when I am listening to a lecture by others, you know, you are there behind your screen, you have to unmute yourself. So, you know, there's so many others who can ask, answer that question uh, too. And so I let that uh, to others. But then at the same time, if then if everybody's waiting for the other one to answer, then then nothing uh, nothing happens. So I had it also in my in my face to face classes. Uh, that was often the case, and I just didn't like it. I thought you're you're here to learn something. Why are you not eager to to throw in your answers? But nobody did. And this is also a, a bit of a personal frustration that I that I often had with teaching. So. I didn't like teaching the very basics of things, you know, it was repeating. So every year, you know, the basics are the same and I got a little bit bored by them. And I also noticed by myself that I became more passionate in also in my, in my teaching when students were asking a little bit more advanced questions. So when they wanted, they read the materials and they really want to know more about it. But often the case, of course, when I don't explicitly call out, um, uh, refer back to the materials or ask them questions and, and invite people to answer, then a lot of time students don't read the materials um, that we are assigning. And so basically I, I had this feeling like, okay, you're not reading what I want you to read. So if you read it, you can ask better questions, but you don't read it. So you don't ask those questions. And so I'm basically telling you what you can read. I thought that was no longer, uh, I, I, I didn't find fun, didn't find it uh, um, any inspiration and also didn't, couldn't imagine that students wanted to have classes like that. And that is what I learned about the flipped classroom um, concept. So the flipped classroom is basically um, turning the exercises and the lectures uh, vice versa. So in a lecture based approach, what students ideally do before class is they read do the reading so to prepare for class at least that's what we hope they do then in class as a teacher um, you uh, give your lecture and then that's what when the students hear for the first time about you know what they need to learn and then afterwards you let them make exercises or practice in a certain way what you do with the flipped classroom is that before uh, class you give you expose students to um, the new material 
So they have to read all the new concepts and the new material at home before class. Then they have to do some kind of exercise before class that shows that they completed, that they did the preparation. And then they come because they have to do this before class, they, uh, which is reading or listening to the material, they come prepared to class and in the class you can have more um, engaging and entertaining and more interesting uh, discussions with the students. So that is the idea behind flipping the classroom. Instead of the, having the lecture in class, you to do that before class and instead of having the um, exercises after class, you do that in class. And so this is the classes, the two classes that I'm uh, taking. And so in the rest of the presentation, I am um, sharing my experiences um, and also my yeah, what I'm doing for these classes at the same time, because this as the setup is essentially the same. And this semester I'm teaching both of them, uh, which is sometimes very confusing to know which class I did which example. But basically uh, what I had, the class that I had this morning is the class for the bachelor students at Emory College. It's for them, it's a 15 week um, class, two hours a week. So um, of 100 minutes a week uh, uh, for two credits. They read a textbook. I will share that in a minute. And they also in these 15 weeks, they in 10 weeks of them, they discuss real news articles from all kinds of uh, news outlets. In the MPH class is shorter, their schedule, there's only a two year program. So they don't have uh, that much time to take a lengthy class like that. So it's only seven weeks. Um, they don't have a textbook, but they have to find their own uh, background literature. Um, I will explain that in a minute too. And instead of 10 news articles, they, we do this only in six weeks. They read six news articles and the science behind them. But the, um, the layout for those classes and the topic, topics that, that we cover, uh, that I cover is, um, is approximately the same. So this is, um, when we think about this critical thinking class, it's not highly philosophical. Uh, you know, I'm not a philosopher and I have very basic knowledge about this, but um, I'm a health psychologist by training and I have a deep interest in, in science communication. So this is the different topics, very practical that I combined into this critical thinking class. So in, this, in the class, the students in the first week or the first two weeks for the bachelors, we, we discuss about how the communication process works. How does science get in the news? So if I, as a researcher, have a scientific study, how does it get in the newspaper? And then I, I, we discuss that there are that is many steps. It's not that I call the newspaper or that the journalist calls me. It's many steps in between. And, and what they find out in the conversation about is that everybody who's involved in that process, it's the scientist, it's the scientific journal, it's the university, it's the journalist. We all have an interest in making the story in the news just a little bit more beautiful to look good. And they, they learn about all the publish and perish and all the, uh, you know, what the interests of the, of the universities are and of the news outlets because they need to have subscribers, etc. So that is uh, where the, um, uh, the background about the communication. Then we start, uh, we talk about the scientific method. So how does science work? Um, how, does, how do researchers come to their study? How do they how they decide about the study designs, but also how, how does um, knowledge accumulate um, across studies. And we also talk about the irreproducibility, um, about levels of evidence, um, etc. Then I also um, share them the basics about logic reasoning. So how, what is a good argument? What's a strong argument and a weak argument? What's a strong case for a claim? And what's a weak case of a claim? Um, and so, so that they have you know, they, they learn how to um, critically read the news, like if the news article um, has a kind of a health claim, that they try to find out what is the basis for that claim and is this a strong claim or is it a weak one. And we also discuss about fallacies and framing, how does reasoning go wrong, um, how do we, uh, why do we get misleading beliefs about uh, studies, you know, it's a large study from Harvard published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Why do we think it's more likely to be a credible study than when it's, um, you know, from a, sm a smaller study from a smaller university in a journal that we've never heard of? How does that work? Um, and in, then in the last sessions, we um, discuss um, the validity of scientific observations and the validity of scientific inferences. That's basically about how certain we are about the conclusions of studies. So it's a very different topics, a, a bit of a mix, but which makes them um, much more understanding of how science of health sciences work. 
So in the bachelor, so here at the corner, I, I, I share with you in which course um, I'm, I'm using this. So this is what, what uh, the book that I'm using in my uh, bachelor class. Um, it's a very accessible uh, book um, f about critical thinking um, and um, has very, um, it's, it's all related, yeah, it's all related about the topic that I was just uh, sharing. So every week students um, read a chapter from this book and they read a news article and the scientific study uh, behind it. So that is that talk, uh, that's that um, task every week. And also in this class, I, I really emphasize um, very strongly that it's learning by doing. So the students do all the work and I will explain that um, in a minute. This is the same um, setup for the, the master, uh, the, master the, the MPH uh, class. They also read a news article and a scientific article every week and they don't have a book to read because uh, the book is too much work for a, for a one credit class. But instead they have to famili uh, familiarize themselves with the key concepts that will be discussed every week. So in the syllabus of the course, I tell them in this short descriptions, what are the key topics that will be discussed that week? And they have to find their information on what is the scientific method and what is the hierarchy of evidence. I give them some easy accessible sources. It's not scientific sources, but these are you know, easy plain language descriptions of, for example, the scientific method. Uh, vetted by me, so I know what uh, what these websites write there is, you know, how the scientific literature writes about it too. But they have to find more information about it. And the reason why they have to find their own course material is, of, of course, that, you know, that becoming critical, um, um, a critical consumer of the news, you know, you have to be curious to find this information. So finding this information is part of the skill set that they, they need to um, develop. And so um, that is that is why I, what I expect them to do. I expect them to, to um, find as much information as they need to uh, understand the concept and be able in class to explain them to um, to themselves or to to each other, and to find additional sources if they um, if needed. And um, so far, students really really like this. So they. Um, um, and they also come, I come back to that later too, they come with sources that I would never have found myself. Um, educational sources that are so much better than I could have ever Googled, Googled myself. Very interesting. So this is the basic structure of my classes. So um, in the bachelor class, I have 14 weeks, sometimes 15. Um, and the first two meetings are introductory. I had this class um, this morning, but all the other meetings are um, um, as follows. So all the meeting, all the weeks in white, um, we have a basic setup that um, at the end of each class, so that's at the end of what we did today, I, inter I shared a news article with the students. And they have never seen that news article. So they are going to brainstorm about, you know, what is the science behind that article and what likely are the pitfalls of that study. I come back to that later. Then in the next week, so next week and the week number three, we start with a news article, discussing the news article from the week before. In that meantime, they have read the news article, they have read the scientific article, and now we can explain, explore the differences between the news article and the scientific article. After that, uh, um, we are going to discuss uh, the chapter of that week. And then at the end of next week's class, I give them again a new news article that they will discuss the week after. And then also, um, so that's the, every the 10 weeks, we do it in this format. And then within those um, um, parts of the class, um, students give a presentation first, and then we have a discussion, then the presentation about the topics, then another discussion, and then the new news article. So it's a very fixed structure, um, nicely organized. Here, halfway, um, we have an, a midterm um, class. It's a kind of a break, but in that class, I review what we've done before. And the same I do at the end, I review what we've done in the second half, just to make sure that everybody understands the basic concepts that need to be taught, need to be learned. In the, in the Master of Public Health class, this structure is the same, it's just shorter. So this news article that I discuss every time at the end of the class um, is just as follows. It's a news article. Today we did a news article from the New York Times, not this one, but similar. And um, the students read it um, 
on the spot. They haven't seen it. I make I have selected those news articles that they are short and readable in, sh in, a, in a limited uh, limited time, and then they brainstorm into groups to find out uh, among each other. You know what is the study that that is described. So a news article always gives a lot of characteristics about the study and about the results and about the flaws of the study. And over time, so in the beginning, it was also today, the students do not know what questions to ask, you know, so but next time when we discuss it, I give them every week a little bit more of information. And so every week you see that the questions about the news article become more informed, more relevant, um, more critical, more curious. And that is the nice thing of doing this repetition over 10 weeks. And so but they do that first in, in subgroups and then plenary the groups, the groups report back what they um, what they discussed. And usually I ask this the first group to describe the study and then the other groups to, you know, to have the critical questions about the study. So that's what we do at the end of the class. Um, and so and then in the next week before class, the students read the news article, they read the scientific article and they read the chapter topic. And, and then before the, as the kind of uh, the quiz to ensure that they prepared everything, instead of asking them to answer a quiz, I ask them to, uh, to ask a question about the news and one question about the chapter and the topic. And those will be discussed and presented and discussed in class. So these questions that I asked them to, um, to ask before is um, I do that on campus. That's our um, um, student platform where we have discussion groups and every discussion group um, is about every weekly uh, topic. Students are going to ask questions about what they read. And the questions, it can be one question or an example, but it should be about something that they don't understand or that they want to know more about. Um, and, um, but the advantage is, I come back to that later too, is that based on their questions, I know what they find most difficult uh, in, the, in the chapter or in the news article. And I use that information for the classroom conversations. So my preparation is about, um, is, is using these, these questions. I explain them before also, you know, what are good questions to ask. I explain them that they should be informative and relevant for others too, not only for themselves. Um, it should be questions that have multiple possible answers that we can discuss. You know, it not, should not be yes, no answers. It should be open questions like, you know, uh, it can be anything, but just not closed questions and should also not questions that they can look up themselves. So sometimes questions, students were asking like, uh, did the uh, researchers adjust for confounders? That's a question that you can look up yourself. That is, uh, those, those are not, uh, these get, those get zero points. Because we do grade the points. If you don't grade the points, then the students don't, don't make the questions. So the questions that they ask contribute to the grading. And so for the grading, what I find important is I cannot, so students ask questions that they don't understand. I'm not going to discuss whether, I'm not going to judge whether that's a good question or of, um, that it's something that they should have known or not known. Uh, you know, students differ in their backgrounds. I have in my bachelor class, I have students from the sophomores to the seniors. Um, some have more epi experience than others. So I cannot judge the level of the question. I can only, and uh, evaluate if that's what I want to do, uh, how they ask the question. And so the question needs to reflect that they read the material and that they processed it and that they thought about, you know, about the topic. So this is a real slide that I share with students. And the question needs to have two parts. It needs to have the question or the example and they have to explain why they ask. Yeah? So, so it's not only dropping the question, but it is, yeah, this question came to mind because I used to think this and now I'm reading this or the author says here this and they and, you know, and then later I read that, or we read in three chapters ago, you know, the author wrote such. I want to know why they are asking. And so then they get also, uh, they get points for that. Just to be very practical here, they have to submit it two days before class. If they are too late, they, uh, they start losing points. And basically in the bachelor program, they get two points if the question is good. Uh, it comes, if it comes too late, it goes one, uh, one point less. And also if it's not well explained or not, well, not really reflecting the, uh, the course material, then they also get a point less. That's how the basic grading works. 
but I let them try first. So they have 10 weeks of, um, of, of questions. And in the first two weeks of them, they get the maximum points, even if, if I am going to give them suggestions to improve their questions. So if students did a try in the first two weeks and it's not good enough, they get the full points, but they also get a recommendation how to do it better after uh, for the last eight questions, because there I, I do uh, subtract the points. So they have two weeks to try. And also what is nice is that they, um, on the Canvas submission of a discussion board, they can um, read the questions of others after they have submitted their own. So when they submit their own, they cannot see it. So they do not know what other students have asked. They cannot copy the questions of others. But once they have submitted their question, they can see what the other students wrote. And then also, so that is how they prepare. So they, they, they sent before class, they sent me a question about the news article and about the, the topics that we are going to discuss, um, which evidences that they process the material. So now I know that my students are prepared. Um, then in the class, um, students have to teach themselves. So I don't do the teaching, the students do the teaching. So the students give a, in one group, they give a presentation about the news article and the science behind it. So they describe what the news was about then they describe the science in a very concise way. So only what is relevant for interpreting the news. And then they compare how the coverage was. And um, yeah, so this they prepare in a short presentation with three students. They also present the key topics. So this is a different group. So every, every group has two presentations throughout the semester, semester and this in the same meeting, this is a different team. Um, so the first, we, um, yeah, so this is the second team and they uh, explain the key topics. Um, they give examples, um, um, you know, so this is, let me be practical. This is what I did today. Today, um, I gave a presentation illustrating them, showing them, this is how you present a chapter like this. So uh, there were a few topics in this um, in these chapters and I explained the concepts. I gave some extra examples. These ex extra examples, they came from the internet. They came, didn't come from the book, but it illustrated uh, the concept. So next week, the students are going to explain what is a mean, the median and the mode, what is the bimodal and skewed distributions, what is the ecological fallacy, exception fallacy and shifting baselines. These concepts they can read in the book, but oftentimes they come with, with extra examples that they Google themselves. And this is just, yeah, let me just use the word, this is just a blast because they come with examples that I, as a teacher, um, twice their age, would never have <laughs> found on the internet. I do not know their world um, quite well. And, and they come with examples also how how they make the, 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 the material relevant for themselves. It is, it is, it is just fascinating. Um, so they explain the topics, they give the examples and they, you know, compare and contrast and compare with, with, with previous weeks or, you know, uh, how, how do the mean, the median and the mode, how do they differ, when are they the same, when are they different. So they explain in their way about it. So what is my role? Because it's not that I um, can lean back and do nothing. Um, my role is uh, uh, before class, I really prepare um, the topics. I know the book by heart by now um, and also know the topics um, that the students are going to discuss. I read the news article and I read the, the science. And then I read all the, um, all the questions that students ask on the discussion board. And this is my notes. This was my notes for today. Um, I make a little summer. I, I write down the topics. And then when I start writing down the topics, I notice that there is a large overlap between the questions that the students ask. And then um, from these questions, I select the ones that are most, most relevant for um, or most suitable for classroom uh, discussion. But what I do then in classroom um, it itself is first, I, I give feedback on the student presentation. So the students give a presentation to the best of their understanding. Sometimes they are really excellent. Uh, then I think, yeah, okay, I have really literally nothing to add. If I had given the presentation, I would have done it in a very similar way. But also sometimes some chapters are a bit more difficult than others. Sometimes I need to add um, something that they, you know, overlooked, or I need to correct something that they misinterpreted when, um, you know, when in, in the presentation, or that's, that they are 
that's what students love to do every now and then to be way more certain than um, you know than justified. So I, I comment on this. Um, so to make sure at least that the students who are listening in the class and that everybody gets gets the information right. And after the presentation, first about the news article and then about the uh, the, the scientific uh, of the topics. I moderate the discussion using their questions. So from these questions, I know what they like to know or what they found most difficult. And what I then do is then I invite those students. Um, so here you see, well, maybe you don't see it, but there are some lines here on, in yellow highlighted. Then I ask the students to, um, from which I selected the question to come online, to, to, to unmute and to to ask their question and say why they are asking. So basically what I read on the on the internet is what I then um, uh, ask students to do. But because they often um, um, ask questions about the same topic, I at the same time, I ask three or four students to come unmute it and then ask their questions. And we have a conversation in that way about what they don't understand. And I sometimes I have to, to always keep an eye on the time. Sometimes we have a lot of time and I can let the discussion go a little bit. Sometimes I am a little bit more quick in, in giving an answer if I have one or giving a further nuance about it. Or um, um, So I'm, I'm quite flexible. Sometimes when I have enough time, I can do more questions. Sometimes uh, we have to, to rush a little bit more because the presentation was too long and then you know, there's a lot of variation in what we can do. But basically what I'm doing here is I use their questions and their input. So they come online and they do not know beforehand if I call on their question. They do not know it. So everybody's there. Everybody knows that I'm calling students, uh, but they do not know who. And it's different students all the time. Um, and uh, so everybody is there um, with me. And I know, th I know that because at the end of the class, when they need to brainstorm about the news article, then they, um, I'm sending them away in, in breakout groups. And it's very rarely that, that students are not there. They know um, that they can be called for a discussion and they need to be there. And they need to be there when they are sent away to breakout groups. So this is, for me, a very ideal way of, of keeping them engaged during the, during the class. So that is about the weekly. Um, conversations that we have, then the students also have to make a, um, a two essays. Uh, the bachelors make two essays, the MBH students only one. In the midterm essay, um, the bachelor students uh, write a bit of a structured essay about five lessons that they learned, five, five eye openers, and one topic that they still don't understand. They have to write them with again, the same um, uh, as, as with the weekly questions, motivated and explained. So they have to explain to me why something is a, a lesson, what they learned. And the stories that they write is just adorable because they, they, they reflect on their own thinking before class and after class. And it is different students of different things, uh, lessons uh, learned. So things that I think, okay, this, this is very deep. You know, you know this, you know this. For some students, things are eye openers. Sometimes students have eye openers for things that I've just said in between two slides in, in week number one. Things that I never would have, would have guessed that it would be an eye opener. Students pick up and that's what I then get back um, halfway. Um, and that's the same task for the MBA student. That's their final assignments. Also five lessons learned. What has this class changed in your thinking? So it's more about the reflection than about, um, you know, that, they, that I review them again, whether they understand the, the concepts. And the, the, the bachelor students, um, at the end of the class, they write a letter to their family and friends with 10 recommendations on how they can read the news more critically. Um, and also halfway with the students, um, they address, um, they mention topics that they still don't understand. These are the topics that I use in my midterm. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an, a class classroom discussions, but basically where I come back on everything that's learned so far, but I use their input to, uh, to decide which topics I, I um, address there. And it's partly lectures, partly also exercises, but it's again using their input. Um, so, wait a minute, I'm missing a slide. Oh, I do not know, I missed a slide. I had a very nice slide. 
Okay, it's gone. Um, so when we think about the teaching, what are one of the challenges um, it is for a teacher to switch from the traditional model to uh, the, the flipped classroom model is absolutely the, um, yeah, that it asks for flexibility and improvisation. So when you prepare your class, your lecture, um, from, you know, from your old slides that you're presenting already, there's, uh, for years, there's nothing more comfortable than just go to class and do those slides and you know you can prepare it you know what to you know what you, what you have to do um, and that is different with this class <clears throat> so it, it requires um, a, a lot of flexibility um, also because I do not know beforehand um, where the discussions exactly are going I have a little bit of control by because I select the questions that will be addressed from their input but I do not know exactly where the uh, conversations are going and also the students may um, um, bring in new topics and that's what they often do because I invite now much more than before the interaction I also get more questions in between um, and these may go in any in any direction so that is one uh, one thing that really was for me also a uh, an, an total switch in approach also in the beginning um, I had to um, get comfortable with letting go. You know, I was over prepared in the beginning and, and, and also preparing all kinds of things that then the students were not asking. And so after, after a few weeks, I became more easily in, in just, um, uh, nah, yeah, uh, leaving things up to, uh, to, um, to chance actually. So, so depending if the students bring up a question that I haven't prepared and I just tell them, yeah, I do not know, I have to look this up and I come back to you uh, a week after. And students uh, love that. They really love it as a teacher when, when there are questions that you don't know. The other challenge is a very big one, at least in my class, um, is the subjectivity in the grading. Because uh, the course is totally, it's, it's, it's guided by what the students find most interesting. Um, um, it is, um, I cannot, the, the differences between students, uh, the difference between, um, for example, if you, if I give pre, the, uh, points for the presentations, some chapters are more easier than others to present. Some news articles are way more challenging than others. And so um, students who have to present an easy news chapter of an easy uh, news article, yeah, they, they, you know, can make the presentation better than students who need to do a more difficult article. Also students who do um, a presentation in the beginning of the semester, when we have little experience in critical thinking, is more difficult than at the end of the semester. So to grade them to the certain extent, uh, the same extent, um, yeah, it requires some subjectivity. And I had to really um, get um, comfortable with, okay, the grades are subjective. That's that's basically how the class um, is. I can I can reflect on that later in the Q and A if there if there are questions about that. Another challenge in both of my classes is that the students come from all the years. So I have one and second first and second year MBA students, and I have first to fourth year BA students, bachelor students, and that is yeah they have different backgrounds, and I cannot um, uh, grade the sophomores in the same way as the seniors. So um, I grade in a different way, and I come. Uh, come, come back. Oh, Rich, I see now a question. Oh, and now, now, oh, no, now I see questions in the chat. I come back to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I apologize. Uh, so uh, this is how I grade, um, uh, roughly grade the uh, assignments. Uh, they get, for the online questions that they asked before class, they get two, two points per question. So it's 10 times two points, 20 points here and there. They get 15 points for the presentation. That's a group um, great. They don't get individual. I'm not going to split it up in for the three students, because then I add an, another layer of subjectivity that I cannot handle. Um, and for the participation online, if if students um, um, join regularly in the conversations, I give them also points. But most of the variation um, between us comes from these two assignments. So here, most of these points uh, are just for the, the presentation and the online questions. They are given if, if the presentation was just well-prepared, well-informed, or well-organized, clear, maybe here and there missing a point, then students easily get the 15 points. They, get, they lose points when it's just a mess. Yeah, so it needs to be clearly underperforming. Will, will you lose points? And the same is for the question. 
Um, and the same is for, also for the part participation online. So the, here, those 20 points, these make the difference. But also when you look at our letter grading, those 20 points can make the difference between, say, um, a C plus to an A. And that is where I want my points to, um, to vary anyway. So these are all the points you're making good questions and a good presentation and participating online brings you here at the, the B minus, so to say. And if you then write nice um, essays, then you get a higher score. That's how the scoring goes. Um, so that is that is that is absolutely a challenge, um, and and also it may be that's always what I uh, what I um, get when I share this with um, uh, with colleagues. They may say, yeah, it works for your topic, um, but it may not work for mine. Um, you know, when you teach complex statistics or whatever, um, that may be. It may not everything, maybe um, for every class. Sometimes you can also, yeah, I ask questions before class, but you can also do exercises before class. It's the format is very different. The idea behind Flip the Classroom is that um, the students prepare beforehand so that you can do the advanced things in class. But here I would definitely recommend don't underestimate your students. I have I see students explaining concepts that I that I'm always asking myself, could I do that at your age? And I, they keep surprising me. And here as a, as a final slide, oh, this was I was looking for. Um, here is a, on Medium, I shared the um, assignments of my, was it, oh, it was earlier this year. Um, the final assignments, the 10 tips to their parents from 10 different students, um, if you are interested. So here are the benefits. For me, it is, it's just, I have really fallen in love with teaching because it's so, uh, you know, to have a class that is really driven by what the students want to know, uh, makes it just, just uh, an enormous pleasure to be their guide in in this in this you know in learning these uh, these skills. So classes are way more interactive. Sometimes I have to call them out, of course, but but by doing that in a very um, every week calling on several students, they become more easy for them to talk, become more easy to speak up. Um, also. What is what is a very what I like of this approach by uh, asking the questions beforehand is that the class is about the things that they want to know, so I can skip what they know already and I can discuss focus on what is challenging and interesting, and this is way more interesting for me as a teacher too. I don't like to, to explain the basics every time they can read that and then I discuss what is you know to bring it to the next level. So I see with students, they have an extremely steep learning curve from asking the questions to their, uh, you know, the quality of the teaching and the quality of the discussions from, from the repetition of these exercises. Um, they, uh, they really, I, see, I see, often see, I see it here um, uh, below. You really, I literally see their eyes pop open um, um, when we were meeting face to face because um, the things make just a lot of sense to them. It really brings it to the next level. It's, um, it's a lot of learning by doing. Uh, so for me as a teacher, uh, I don't have to prepare all the slides. That's uh, what they are doing. But I need to be on top of it. And then oftentimes, you know, after the two hours of teaching, I'm often exhausted by paying too much attention. But that is, it's, it's, all, it's all worth it. The, the class is curiosity driven. Um, and the yeah, students surprise me every time again with digging up sources and bringing in examples that I never thought of. And also the midterm and the final assignments, especially the final assignments to the letters to their family to, um, and friends. They are just, just adorable. If you see how they reflect on their own uh, learning, on their own, what, what I thought before and what I know now, that is, um, that is just mind blowing to see. And the evaluations are also very clear. Students really love the approach and love the interaction. They love it that they don't have to listen all the time to, uh, to those classes. And um, so for me, it is absolutely worth, um, uh, worth the change, worth the investment. And, and it may not work, but I said, may not work for every class. But I think when you have some opportunities to, um, um, you know, to try certain elements of it, I would definitely encourage you to do. That is what I wanted to share. Um, I see that there are a lot of questions in the class, often in the in the chat. Um, how shall we do it, Mark? Would you like me to read those, or do you, would you like to read? Yeah, that would be nice. Or, the, or or let me do it in the in the class way. You know, I can ask people to speak up. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, because it is very hard to uh, hard to read so on the spot. But um, 
Yeah, they can use the raise hand feature and then I can unmute them if yeah, that would, otherwise that would, you could just yeah. start reading the questions unless you want me to read them. Yeah, if, if you can read them it would be very nice. From Sarah Tamala, um, how do you evaluate students when they miss class and aren't involved in the active learning aspects with their peers and the rest of the class? Yeah, um, almost not. So I only, I only evaluate what I see. Um, so if students miss class, they are, uh, the, the bachelor students, if I remember correctly, are allowed to miss two classes. Um, um, if they do, um, then that happens. I don't count it. So I count uh, everything. So, th so these 10 points that they get for active uh, participation in class, um, it is just to encourage them to be actively there. I, ha I don't have that much, uh, that many students who, who miss classes, but um, they get the points for the questions, for the presentations, and for the assignments. So, um, yeah. It seems like the way this is set up, there's a lot more incentive for them to, to be present and active. Yeah, yeah and, and also they, they, they really enjoy it. And that is, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. For Rich McElhose, uh, did you first design your class as flipped or did you flip the class after you've been teaching for a while? Any advice on flipping an existing class? Yeah, so I, I, I was teaching this class already uh, for the master students since 2013. And um, so for uh, uh, with, with the same topics, um, but the, and also the same, they had to prepare everything in advance, but I didn't ask. So they, they are the only thing that I really uh, changed was that they have to ask the question on the discussion board before class. So that basically I have now more, um, um, I verify more that they really prepare the material. And so that class was always, um, um, so that, that class, they were always already doing these, um, the presentation about the news article. But in that class, I still do the presentation about the topics because the class is too short. Um, and uh, so we don't have, have the time. Um, so I do a brief introduction, brief presentation about the topics, but then immediately use their questions, you know, to, um, to do the conversation. Yeah. And it is a lot of work I hear from others that it's not easy to flip a class when you teach it already for, uh, for several years. Um, but at the same time, you know what they need to learn. So uh, that makes it, uh, makes it a bit more easy. Right. Let's see here from Kumi Smith. I think as an instructor, I'm always slightly worried that students may not invest adequate time in the projects before showing up for class. Have you experienced that? Um, do we as instructors just need to have more faith in our students? Well, so uh, Kumi, yes, absolutely. I had this a lot, all the time in the old model. You know, when I didn't ask the students to submit that question before class, but submitting a question, you know, to, there's, a, there's this hierarchy of, you know, in processing information. Answering a question, you can go, the students can just look up the question, go to that paragraph in a chapter where the answer to that question is and don't read the entire paragraph. With, with asking a question that's much more difficult. Um, and it is a high, they really have to process the material uh, to be able to ask a question. And then also they know that the question may be asked, they may be, they may be asked to ask a question in class. So they need to prepare very well <laughs> to be able to do that. So I have it, I have it way less, uh, of course I don't, I don't check everything. So I don't check everything, um, whether they get every detail right, you know? Um, that may be different when you teach certain stat statistical classes where they you know, may need to get more details right. It is more that this class, uh, you know, these are millennials, so they look up everything and they, they, they see so much information, but they are not critical to information. So I would like to, the main goal of the class is to make them more critical, not to get every detail right. And so there may be that they, um, um, I, de I definitely, feel that the class is much more prepared than other times. So now in the first week, I have a few students who submitted their question today and the question, I cannot read from the question whether they read the material. So they get a note. <laughs> so that's not good. You can do that now, you get now, you get your points. In two weeks from now, if you do the same thing, you don't get your point. I need to see you reflect the material. Yeah. And I do think, Komi, that we need to have more faith in our students because, uh, and that is what I said, you know, these students, they, 
when I read these midterm assignments and these final assignments, first of all, it is a joy to grade those classes. Um, I have 30 students in each class. It's a, it's a lot of reading, but um, it's just, it's just, especially the final assignment, the letter to their family and friends, it's just adorable. <laughs> and it's just nice to see them reflecting. And I think I have definitely um, underestimated my students and also overestimated at the same time. There are just topics that I think, yeah, this is what they know. And then there come all the questions are about such topics. And what I think that they, um, you know, is most challenging for them, that's, that's easy. So I made a lot of judgment, wrong judgment calls earlier. Rachel Whittem says, hi, Cecile, this is really interesting. It sounds like a fun class. How large of a class do you think you could manage in this format? I had the same question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it should not be too large. It doesn't work for a class of 150 students. Um, I, have, um, uh, this, I have two classes of 30 students at this moment. And I think 30 is, a, is, is about the max. Okay. Yeah, I have not tried it uh, because then when the class is much larger, um, I, but I don't have the experience. I do not know what are other things you can go to 50. But if it's 50, it's less likely that you get a turn, uh, you know, during, mm -hmm. during the conversations. Right. And with this, now they need to be prepared because also this morning, it's I think about 10 students got called on and that, you know, in, in the different discussions, discussion blocks, we have five, six students Per, uh, per conversation have to unmute themselves. So then it's a reasonable chance that you get a turn. Uh, uh, yeah. And then Diana Mark Steiner, um, she um, loves the style of teaching, but she's wondering, do you ever get complaints from students that they're doing all the work? And what about when students just don't do such a great job presenting? Also wondering if the style of teaching works, works better via Zoom or in person? Yeah, so I've, uh, to start with the last question, I've done this both. So I had already switched, flipped the classroom before uh, going online. So that was also when we had to go online uh, um, last March. Uh, for me, it was a very easy transfer. Um, so it works both in person. And the only thing that works a little bit better in person is that you can make eye contact with students. You know, so I can look you in the eye, Mark, right now, and then say, and then basically by making eye contact only, uh, invite students to speak up. I missed that opportunity on online teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a little bit more um, unhandy online, I would say, but um, uh, because the nonverbal communication is not so clear. But uh, do I ever get complaints for students that they do all the work? No, uh, Diane, and that is also because I do a lot of work too, <laughs> but a lot of work is in, well, I, I should say very honestly, I can say uh, I, I got a little bit of a problem into problem with, with the PhD students because I also moderate the journal club for the PhD students and it works along the same lines. They need to read an article every week and they, um, um, they also submit a question about that article, article before journal club. So I know that everybody read the article because that was before, it was also a problem that the students came and they let this, they let the conversation to a few interested PhD students, and the rest was leaning back. But now they all have to submit a question. But um, there, in the evaluation, um, I did get um, uh, you know some remarks that were not so very nice because they thought you know I was always giving the turn to the same students. I always asked the same the questions of, by the same students, but they did not realize. Um, that uh, so they thought that I had a preference for the more eager students and better students, but no, they, those better students were the ones who submitted their question in time. <laughs> the rest was just too late, and the rest was just, <laughs> just delivering the question just on the day, a few hours, sometimes an hour before journal club. And to them, I was really explaining uh, last week. I said I prepare those conversations. It's not that <laughs> you know that I come to class and then you tell something and then I you scroll a little bit and pick up randomly a question. So I group and I prepare and I, I select which ones are the most important uh, for, um, uh, for class. And ideally, you know, when, when the class goes excellent, then you don't see my preparation. But when things fall a little bit short here and there, for example, when a student doesn't so, do so good in a presenting job um, and they miss things or they are too nervous and they get, don't get, in those moments you see then my preparation is is needed so if everything goes well then uh, and students raise their questions themselves and everything then my role seems uh, zero 
but I'm still there, all prepared in case it doesn't go that way. And to answer that question, uh, Diane, um, so when yeah, the, the, the presentation skills of the students vary, vary a lot. But there I'm always reminding to my own presentation skills when I was a student, I just skipped the classes that required the presentation because I was too scared <laughs> to present. And, and so um, I just take those differences as is. So a student who is not so very good in presenting, um, who's, who's clearly doing their best and, and, and as a group clearly prepared, uh, I give them still the full points. So that's also what I'm saying. These first 80 points out of 100, they are basically for doing a good job. And there's always variation. Um, there's also enormous differences in level. Um, and it is those, you know, the, the points that you need to get from a C plus to an A, uh, there is where the, the individual assignments come in. Yeah. So the rest is basically giving points for just doing your thing, <laughs> you know. So asking your questions, preparing your work, and if you prepare everything okay, and you give your presentations okay, and um, then you get already um, most of the points. There is a nice, um, I'm going to pause one second and be. Oh. So, oh, it's coming back. Okay. Yeah, Diane. Yeah. No, I was just going to read what Rich wrote, but Mark is back. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, sometimes my son likes to wrestle with the dog upstairs. <laughs> um, so, Rich says, uh, Rich, Rich has a nice plug. So, Rich McLehouse on our faculty recommended you. He said that he's frequently used articles that you discuss in your medium writing for his journal clubs. Um, he says that way I can give them your excellent deconstruction of the article afterwards. Very highly recommend your medium site to anyone who hasn't seen it. It's great in its own merits, but also a good teaching resource. Thank you. So there you go. Thank you. That's very, very nice. Uh, yeah. And so it is. Uh, yeah. I thank you. I have nothing to say about it. It is something that I, uh, you know, also use as a kind of training for myself. I really like to, um, you know, when we have a lot of busy then we don't have much time I, I let speak for myself don't have much time to think about things and those uh, little writings um, um i really try to always find what is the essence of what's wrong with the study and uh, instead of just critiquing all the way and finding nitpicking on everything um there are a lot of things wrong with the study but it just um not everything matters and that's what I try to get at, at in my uh, in my writings. And sometimes I'm just also uh, very upset huh, about <laughs> about articles when they get in the news when the, when researchers, um, um, you know, just just oversell their study completely in the news without any reservations. Um, I think that's not the way forward. All those. Can I just say something? Sometimes that comes from the communications people who really, or the, or the person interviewing you from, you know, and they really, really push you. Well, what was new and what was surprising? And, and um, that's something that as researchers, I think we need to know to resist, but yeah. it, it can be hard. It is, it is. And um, um, that's, that's definitely happening. And, and, uh, and we need to, to uh, you know, to harden ourselves against that to that also, you know, it's, it's too easy when you when you are not experienced in talking with the media. Um, those journalists always have those, those tricky questions that you just asked. Yeah, they, they invite you to uh, go beyond your findings, and you need to resist. But also at the same time, um, I'm currently writing a book uh, along those uh, same lines as the Medium articles. Um, and in that book, I discuss um, scientific articles that were presented in the news in the wrong way. And I only use articles that wrote a press release first. <laughs> and you see there that the, that the things that go wrong in the media, they often go wrong first in the press release by the university. And it's also universities who often write catchy titles um, um, that then get misrepresented in the news. Yeah. And um, I would like to share, um, in closing, I'd like to share your Medium link. Okay. Rich also requested that. So I'm gonna put it into the chat here. 
Thank you. Let's see if I get this right. Yeah, and then we'll we can also circulate it to everybody okay. uh, later. Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, did I convince you of going for the flipped classroom? I'm I'm looking forward to trying it. I've I've got a class that I think will work well in with about 15 students. Yeah. And I need to figure something out because my teaching has gotten stale and I've gotten sometimes discouraged. So I'm really energized by this. Really okay. appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It is really. I find it. I find it so much more interesting. Uh, then um, it's more moderating than teaching um, and uh, yeah I feel that I'm way more f because I'm not over prepared I'm prepared during the classes but I'm not over focused and in control of I have to do the presentation I have to um, I have more easy more a different mindset when I go to class yeah. it's more you know, uh, more stimulating the curiosity in them, coming them with the questions. And of course, a little bit checks and balance here and there to make sure that they get the information right and, and the learning objectives right. But um, it's, it's, it's nice. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, this morning. This was really interesting. We learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of people will be in touch with, with questions and follow up. Oh, sure, sure. So sure. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.